Ok, my friend, you know, you know problem. They can have a legal permit to man. Meet Palebo, a digital nomad from Denmark on an epic journey around the world. My name is Palebo, and I'm a long-time radio producer. In 2013, I started planning to become a digital nomad and a full-time traveler. Three years later, I had sold my house, my car, and all my furniture. And in July 2016, I set out on a quest to visit every country in the world. In this podcast, I'm taking you along on my journey. And I'm sharing my ups and downs and let you listen in to conversations with some interesting people I meet along the way. This is the Radio Vagabond podcast. This is going to be uh, a week where I'm going to be traveling a hell of a lot. First, I'm leaving South Senegal and uh, will head down to Guinea-Bissau. And if you're someone like me, before I started traveling, I must admit that I didn't even know that there was a country called Guinea-Bissau. I definitely didn't know anything about it. But it's a small country south of, uh, of Senegal. We're in the Western Africa. Maybe it would be a good idea to open up Google Maps or, or take a look at the radiobackupon.com where I put a map so you can sort of keep track of where it is that I'm going in the next week. Well, Guinea-Bissau is uh, south of, uh, of Senegal and uh, it's, uh, it's a fairly short ride from uh, Cap Skiring uh, up to Siginshaw and then down to Bissau, the capital of Guinea-Bissau, uh, on, on bumpy roads. From here, I'm heading further east to the neighbor country, Guinea, to go to with the capital, Conakry. And looking at the map, it would make sense just to get in another car or another bus and then drive the 500 kilometers uh, east to uh, Conakry. But I have some friends who travel around the world and uh, also in Guinea, and they, they t- told me not to go overland to uh, Conakry. So even though looking at the map and it's, I feel it doesn't make any sense, I'm driving all the way back to Dakar, the capital of Senegal. And looking at the map, you will see that uh, Gambia is sort of a a foot in the middle of Senegal and I don't think we'll be passing through uh, Gambia I think uh, it might take us around Gambia so it's a pretty long drive that's probably going to take uh, all day and that's going to be Sunday I could do it Monday uh, but Tuesday morning very early in the morning I'm flying uh, to uh, to Conakry so to make sure that I'm there in time I'll I'll do it Sunday instead so one more day in uh, in Dakar the capital of Senegal and then Tuesday morning I fly down to Conakry uh, I'm there uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, so I got half a day the first day and then a full day the next day before I, Thursday morning, uh, fly towards Cape Town. And finding a, a flight to Cape Town, uh, I feel that I was lucky because I found a, a fairly cheap flight that is giving me two days in Ethiopia, which is... Uh, in the eastern part of uh, of Africa, so I fly to Ethiopia on Thursday, and, and spend two days there before I fly down to Cape Town. So a, a week full, full, full of of, of of travels and a lot of adventures, uh, and that's going to be so exciting. But first, it's Guinea Bissau. <laughs> I'm in a minibus with 14 other people, 14 other the locals, and I'm about to uh, make my way all the way down to the capital of Guinea Bissau, just called Bissau. It's quite early in the morning, and uh, I will expect that I'll be there sometime tonight. Uh, this minibus takes me to Siginshaw. It's two, three hundred kilometers, and it cost me 
two euros and uh, from there I'm getting on another uh, down to the border and after I cross the border I get into another minibus or a shared taxi and then make my way down to Bissau. Depending on how long the border crossing will take and how fast I'll be able to get in another in another minibus or set place one of those old seven seater uh, Peugeot. I'm not sure that that what uh, will uh, decide how long it takes before I arrive at Bissau. But I'm so looking forward to that. And this is the Radio Vagabond podcast. When I crossed the border between Senegal and Guinea-Bissau, something different happened. In the last episode from Cap Skiering in Senegal, you could hear me talking about me being seen as a Tupac, a white Westerner who always paid around five times more than what the locals paid. Here, on the border, it was different. Did you pay? Yeah. I did not. Uh, it's okay. This is Africa. You know, I was there was a local black guy with the same minibus as me, and we went into the border control together. I, I, want, I wanted you to do not pay him, but that's what I'm telling him. Look, he's a citizen, I'm a citizen like him. But the problem, actually don't and the weird thing, thing was that they asked money pay, of him to cross the border to and not people, me. They don't learn nothing. They don't, they have not been to school. Devil people. people. When you hate your country, people say, that, no, you're not patriot. Mm. How can you be patriot like this? Yeah. You're taking my money. I'm a student. I told you already. Yeah, exactly. He was quite upset that he had to pay to cross the border. He called them corrupt and said that it was hard for him to be patriotic when they demanded money of him, a young student. This episode of the Radio Vagabond is supported in part by Hotels25.com. It's a website that helps you find the best prices on hotel rooms around the world in one simple search. Try it out, would you? It's Hotels25.com. Back in the minibus, the young guy was still upset that he had to pay to cross the border. This is corruption. This is what is killing us in Africa here. It's all about corruption. There's not a reality inside. Just someone is asking you money. You look at it. They didn't give you a receipt and there's nothing to mean that you pay. Yeah, yeah. It's all about just giving them money. That's yeah, exactly. all. Exactly. If you look at also the salary that I'm taking, that can push them into such corruptions. Because if you are... You are man working with the government side and then you're not well paid. How will you have to spend your money money again? You take money illegally. I found a place to stay in Bissau and as I normally do I introduce myself, I write in English, but to my big surprise I got a response back in Danish. It said Oh, you're so welcome. Call me when you get here so I can come and pick you up, have a nice trip and see you soon. Frederik. In Danish. And it turned out that Frederik wasn't the only Danish guy here. He's a young PhD student and a doctor. He works with a vaccine project founded by a Danish guy. I'll get back to that in a few minutes. But first a little bit more about this country, the Republic of Guinea-Bissau. It covers nearly 14,000 square miles with an estimated population of 1.9 million. When it was declared independent in 73 and recognized in 74, the name of its capital, Bissau, was added to the country's name to prevent confusion with the neighbor country, Guinea, formerly known as French Guinea. Most of the population speak Creole, it's a Portuguese based language, and the rest speak a variation of native African languages. It's a very poor country. The country's per capita gross domestic product is one of the lowest in the world.
I arrived to Bissau already at 2.30 p.m. So it was a smooth ride. Well, on bumpy roads, but smooth when it comes to not so much waiting time. I agreed with my host that I would either call him or send him a text message when I arrived. I tried to do that on both my Danish phone and the phone with my Senegalese SIM card, but none of them worked. So there I was on a dusty, noisy bus station in the heat, in a place where the locals only speak Creole, local African dialects and maybe some Portuguese and French hardly any English at all. So I decided to sit down at a local bar and figure out what to do and get a bottle of water. I started chatting with a local guy called Albert as best I could in my broken French. I got him to call my host Frederick on his phone and Frederick could tell me that apparently I got off at the wrong bus station but Frederick told him where I needed to go and Albert said that he would drive me there. I got into his car and then he drove like crazy through the city and got lost several times. During the crazy ride, Albert speaks to Frederick about how to find the way. Frederick is fluent in Creole and a big help for me. But like I said, it was quite a crazy ride. And again, I was back to being the two-pap, the white westerner who always pays extra. But I improved. I managed to negotiate this price from 5,000 West African CIFA to 3,500. That's from 7.6 euros to 5.3 euros. So I was quite proud of myself. When I got there, Frederick could tell me that the right price was maybe around 1.5 euros. A thousand CIFA. So I paid 3.5 the regular price. It's not a lot of money, it's more like the principle that in one way is super annoying, but at the same time is quite thought-provoking and maybe even entertaining. I guess you just have to say, never mind. Okay, my friend, you know? You know problem. Here I just arrived after the crazy ride and meet Frederick for the first time. It's Albert you can hear in the background. Hi. <laughs> when I get here I meet another Dane, Mede. Mede is one of their friends and she just got here to Bissau as well. She's been here before and is a good friend of Frederick and his wife Svetlana. Even though Svetlana may sound more Russian or East European, she's an African woman born and raised here in Bissau. They met back in 2015 here in Bissau where they were next door neighbors. Her name is Svetlana because her father is educated in the former Soviet Union and had a close friend called Svetlana. It's a tradition here in the country that you name your children after people you either are good friends with or are inspired from. And this tradition is also something that Frederick and Svetlana has used. They named their daughter Mede from the friend that just arrived. I spent the most of the next day when Frederick is at work at the side of their pool where the two Medas are in the water. But Mede Mede and Svetlana also takes me for a walk around town and down to the waterfront. On this trip I became good friends with Mede. She lets me carry her around. That is, <laughs> Mede the baby. <laughs> In the nighttime, Frederick and his family invited me to meet some of their colleagues. They invited me to eat goat. Frederick told me that they bought 13 pounds of goat. Like I mentioned, Frederick is a Danish doctor and he works here with the Bandem Health Project. It's a health and democratic surveillance system site situated here in Guinea-Bissau. When we got there, it wasn't goat. It was 
wild boar. They shot a real wild boar that were cooking in the kitchen when we arrived. A lot of the people working at the Bandam Health Project are Danish doctors and scientists, but there are also local people working here. One of them is John Paul. I'm working at uh, Simon Mendes Hospital, that is a uh, main hospital in Guinea Bissau. And um, I'm working for Bandam Health Project uh, since 2009. Bandam Health Project follows a population of more than 200,000 individuals in the urban and rural Guinea Bissau. This provides a unique platform for conducting health research. It was founded by a Danish anthropologist, Peter Obi. He came here to Bissau in 78 and set out to understand the reasons for the high mortality among children in Guinea-Bissau. Before or at the beginning of Banding Hill project, the mortality was very high in Guinea-Bissau. At that time, every second child died before it was five years old. That is very bad. Peter Obi began to register and monitor the population in the suburb Bandim, and so he created a unique research station, the Bandim Health Project. The project is the oldest of its kind in Africa and one of the largest. So from now on with Peter Obi, we start project and now project make a lot of studies, a lot of things, a lot of good things happen. Now it's like in... Uh, the percent is very, very low. It's like one or two in every ten. So it's very low. Mortality rate for children is now down to 20%. Yeah, that is very good. Still high, but a lot lower than the 50% back in the late 70s. I also spoke to John Paul about the country and he feels that Guinea-Bissau still has a problem that there are a few extremely rich and a majority of extremely poor people. The bad thing is you have a small amount of people that is getting all our money and they still fight each other and all people are very, very poor. And, uh, so a few very rich and a lot very poor. poor. That is exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that needs to be changed. Yeah. That's something interesting. That was almost it for this episode. Brought to you in part by Hotels25.com. It's a website that helps you find the best prices on hotels around the world hotels25.com. Now I'm going to the neighboring country, Guinea, and the capital, Conakry. It's not that far if I just drove there, but like I mentioned, I have to go all the way back to Dakar and then fly down to Conakry, because apparently it's not super safe to drive into the country. So I'm going back to Dakar, and I'm so looking forward to that. My name is Palabo, and I gotta keep moving. See ya.